Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Devin Elder. And Devin is a principal in, in 3,000 plus stores, a multifamily. He's owner and vertically integrated DJE family of companies, founder of 501c3 nonprofit, the DJE Foundation. Uh, Devin has been somebody I've known for a number of years now. It's been incredible to see his growth, uh, the just the trajectory of his business uh, businesses now, uh, and just the way he has grown. We dive into that today. Really, he calls it the flywheel effect uh, and building that momentum, just the hustle in the beginning into to things that are happening now. And a few key things are that have helped him to do that, to really get out of his own way, finding the right people uh, and uh, building the processes that I know are going to be crucial for you as you grow in this business uh, or any business for that matter, but just really having the mindset uh, around handing things off to people. And, and it's difficult, right? For most of us as entrepreneurs, because we want to see things done right, quote, right? The right way, uh, what we feel like is the right way. Uh, but it's not till we can hand things off to others when we can move so much faster. And typically those things are going to be done better often uh, than you could have done anyway. So I, I hope you enjoy the show. I also want to mention that, you know, I've had some internet issues recently at the house, unfortunately, but I've had a friend uh, who's uh, uh, an owner in a business uh, locally where I live. He's allowed me to, to uh, video and, and shoot the production of the podcast in his business. Uh, but he is, it's a business that we have used and we use to connect, believe it or not, with our investors. And this is a business that I think that you need to know about. Uh, and it's called lifelonggifts.com. I hope you will look them up as you are nurturing those relationships and you want to send a gift to an investor or a friend or a family member. I mean, even the holidays coming up, right? You're thinking about sending uh, a gift to someone who has been crucial or a mentor or somebody in your business or, or whatever who has helped you out. And they, they can send something for you. And it, and it have, you know, that person's name on it, right? Uh, it can, you know, you know, think about ways to, I mean, this is one way that we have built loyalty with investors too, is, is sending them gifts that have, say, their family name on it, right? And then every time they see this gift, you know, even their entire family, right? They think of you, they think of your business. Uh, and so it's just another positive interaction that you don't even have to be a part of anymore, right? You send them that gift. Uh, and so I just encourage you to look at lifelonggifts.com. They just have some amazing gifts that I know will help you and your relationships and building that loyalty, that trust with your investors uh, and other people in the industry. I hope you enjoy the show. Devin, welcome to the show. It's been an honor to to know you over the last what number, I mean, a few, quite a few years now, uh, and just watch this massive growth and just your company do so well. Uh, I know there's. Uh, I'm just looking forward to jumping into that today. Uh, you were a guest many hundreds of shows ago. Uh, it's and, and you know now it's just been incredible what you've built, and I know we're going to dive into some of the key things today that it helped you to do that. Uh, but give us a little bit of an update uh, about uh, DJE. And, and maybe the a couple of recent big things that you've done maybe over the last year or two uh, within the company. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Whitney. Always good to see you. Great to catch up. I still marvel at your daily podcast. And when you talk about hundreds of shows ago, that's, I tip my hat to you on um, just the, the volume of, of content and the quality too of your show. So very glad to see you again. Great to, great to be a guest and thanks for having me on. Um, the last year, uh, it's been great. You know, it's, it's um, we're really hitting our stride in my companies with kind of this flywheel effect, right? Where like anything, the beginning it's, it's an exponential curve. It's so in the beginning, it's nothing. You're busting your tail, you know, more than anybody, you're really busting your tail in the beginning. And, and it's, there's not a direct correlation in the way there is in a W2 job where it's a kind of time trade for money. And there's a direct one-to-one -one correlation there. Building these businesses, as you know, is is a lot of work up front. But anyway, we've been at it for a number of years, um, and a lot of the momentum that we've built up across across the companies is really starting to pay off. Where the flywheel is tough to get started, but once it gets running, it's hard to stop. And I think we're in that we're in that space now. Now, I don't want to get too confident here and say we're unstoppable or whatever, because 
March, 2020, you know, threw a wrench in everybody's business. It was a scary time, ended up working out fine, but um, you know, we're always trying to look for, look for ways to improve and everything. But so some big things for us a couple of months ago in the summer of 2021, we closed a 400 unit project in San Antonio with six acres. We actually have a meeting after this with a construction uh, uh, general contractor to look at building more units on that property. So it's just a huge project. We were able to, to go in and do a rebrand. And so that's been really exciting. We promoted a bunch of people on our team because of that purchase. Um, it was, you know, like a lot of these multifamily deals, it needed some capital injection. So that's a polite way of saying, you know, there was some improvements needed on the property. So we have, you know, multi-million dollar budget there that we've begun executing with a rebrand and exterior and interior upgrades. And it's really cool to see communities change as you know, you know, uh, so you can come in, inject capital. So that's the kind of project we're doing now. And I, you know, my first multifamily was a six unit. So now, you know, Fast forward a few years, buying a 400 unit. It's just been absolutely incredible. Um, along the way, we developed a property management company. That's gone extremely well. That's grown from one employee I hired to run it to now 40 employees or close to 40 employees managing all of our assets, starting to manage some, some friends of ours assets here in central Texas, slowly kind of branching out of third party management. Um, and then myself just continuing to focus on being a good visionary for these companies. Um, and this is, this is, you know, I was really impacted by the book rocket fuel by Gino Wickman. He wrote, um, you know, kind of founder of the EOS entrepreneurial operating system and the book that kind of launched all of that. Um, so really impacted by that book and focusing just more and more on just being the visionary for the company, dialing in on my personal strengths and surrounding myself with people that can execute, and um, execute the, the 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 vision that I set forth for the companies, and really kind of leaning into that role. It's been a big learning process, for sure. But I I relish that, right? I like being on the leading edge of things, figuring out new things, building systems, and handing them off to people. So that's the long answer. What's kind of been going on the last year? No, that's that's just incredible, right? I mean, you know, three three thousand plus doors, right? I mean, vertically integrated, numerous companies, forty plus employees now. Uh, I know you're you're also starting a nonprofit, uh, you know, that we mentioned in the intro, and, and uh, I mean, it's just incredible to see the growth. And I'm glad you mentioned as well, like you started with a six unit. I th- I just think that's great for listeners to hear as well. You know, whether they are a passive investor or whether they're that that one that person that wants to be the active operator, right? And it's just hard to get their mind wrapped around, really, can I buy a hundred unit complex? Uh, You know, well, you know, you started the six unit and man, you know, you just closed on a 400 unit project and not just anyone's doing that, right? Congratulations, by the way. It's just incredible uh, to see that. So, but let's jump into what you mentioned there on the end. I mean, not just everyone can grow companies like that or thinks that way and, or takes those steps, right? Uh, They may even understand some of it, but man, it's, it's fearful. I mean, there's fear, right? And, and taking those steps uh, to getting to where you are, you do have to take some risk, no doubt about it. But uh, a big part of that is building the processes, like you mentioned, and being willing to give that to somebody else, right? And so let's jump into that. Let's, you know, if you could go back a few years, thinking through some of the processes and even help it, that's helped you even get to where you're at now. Let's jump into some of those that were crucial in just the growth uh, and and just being steady, right? Uh, you know, and you all just being confident in, in what you all are doing and, and, and even your team. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, a, a lot of uh, the mechanics of the bigger deals is actually quite similar. It's actually quite simple once you understand it and it's similar to smaller deals. And so it's this idea of like, well, let's just add a zero and do bigger deals and which is clearly easier said than done. But the mechanics of the larger deals is, is, fundamentally the same as it is for the smaller deals. And there's some advantages even to the larger deals, as you know, Um, my process. So like a lot of entrepreneurs starting out, it was me working 20 hour days in the beginning, right? Um, Not every day, but you know, there, there was a a while there where um, the business was on my mind or I was working on it uh, um, pretty much every waking moment. Right. And I think that piece is necessary a lot of times to break out of the inertia and the gravity of like a W2 situation or whatever. I know you know that. <laughs> and other entrepreneurs that, that have been at it a little while know that as well. But the, in terms of, you know, it really becomes inefficient 
as the entrepreneur to to do everything yourself because you've got uh, extremely finite time. Even if you just add one person and they can perform at 25% of your level or 10% of your level, you double the amount of workable hours, right? At another person and you triple the amount of hours. So even if it's not as hard charging as maybe a founder, um, you, you're getting more efficiency there. So the first person I had was somebody overseas in the Philippines, just a full-time virtual assistant. And that, that um, was very, um, frankly, a painful process for me because I've used to go in a million miles an hour and just, ah, just move out of my way. I, I'll take care of it to, to stop and, and take an hour to build a, a training on a pro- for a process that takes five minutes in the moment is inherently like really painful for me to like slow down and do that. But then once you train effectively, create some, some training, hand that off, then you buy yourself that five minute activity a thousand times over into the future. And if you do the math on that, you're, you're coming out ahead. So that actually was a blessing in disguise. My frustration trying to train somebody overseas. Um, and she was great. She actually works for a friend of mine in California who's a multifamily operator. When I outgrew her, um, I put in a, a, a group, I posted in a group I'm a, a part of that she was really great, but I'd outgrown her and she knew the multifamily business and a friend of mine hired her years ago. He's, she still works for him. It's a really cool story. Um, so that was my first kind of employee from there. It grew to somebody local in the office and the same thing. Just, I really think that, that anything that we're pursuing, um, with enough, time and attention, it really can be broken down into all the composite steps. And it can be, it can be painful to do that. I'll give you an example. On one of our companies, um, there was a process that I was ready to completely hand off to my team. And I wrote down the steps and, you know, pull up my iPhone, Apple notes, actually shared it with my team members. I'm like, Hey, I'm getting ready to build the process around this and hand it off to you guys. I think it's about 10 steps. Uh, And then over the weekend, I sat down and really catalog every single step so I could build training. And it was 52 steps. So there's a lot more in my head than I thought. But I think once you can embrace the fact that you really can catalog it down to a series of, of steps on a process and then hand that off. And that's really important for your team because if you're just handing off uh, um, you know, direction or you're handing off tasks with, without a lot of direction around it, that's just kind of a, a recipe for disaster. So I think my skill set has really been identifying opportunities. I mean, I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm the guy to go first. I'm okay with risk, um, you know, for myself personally, or trying out a business idea in, on my own account. And then if I can get it to work well, maybe we'll talk about bringing in investors a year later or something like that. That's gone well, but um, building a process, cataloging it, creating training, building some systems around it, and then handing that off. And then now I can go focus on the next big thing. And I think my, our businesses have just been a series of that over and over and over. I have the vision for something, try it out myself, get in there, do it, get it to the point where it's working and I like it. And then codify it, catalog it, build the training, train the team, hand it off. And then all of a sudden, you know, you look back and go, oh gosh, my investor relations guy uh, is raising millions of dollars and I, and I, I'm not involved in the process. It's amazing, right? Our property management company is managing, you know, all these properties, doing takeovers and doing, you know, running, running everything. And I'm, you know, I'm not on site uh, calling the shots there. I'm just kind of reading the reports and managing this stuff. And, and uh, it's certainly as a founder, um, really hard to hand off control. Right. And I think that's the entrepreneurial trap where, nobody can do it better than me. And so you're, you're not going to hand it off. Um, I get it. I, I kind of fight that every day, but um, there's been so much freedom for, for me personally. And then it's also, it's also not restricting the growth of the companies when you're able to, to hand it off to a team member. And if you're creating the right training, you're really creating some redundancy for the company. You know, if I get hit by a bus, if one of my team members leaves, whatever the case is, you've got this training where somebody can come in and pick up and, and take over, which really as a business owner is, is, is your responsibility to, to build that kind of um, uh, knowledge around the processes that's not tied up in someone's mind, whether it's an employee, whether it's me, 
It's I've heard people call that the what Mack truck theory. It's like if you get hit by a Mack truck or yes. you know something similar, what happens, right? Who knows how to do those things? And man, uh, such such great advice there. It is it is a trap almost, right? And mentally, like oh, I can't give that to anyone else. Nobody's going to be able to do that as good as me. And, and I'll tell you one just a recent a personally thing that I, I just had to recently go through that exact thing. It is this process as becoming an entrepreneur. You got to keep handing things off so you can do things better. And ultimately, some people, most people, are going to do things some things, but a lot better than you, right? That you're handing off. Uh, but, you know, it hit me a couple months ago that, uh, you know, I just have this mindset thing around or me wanting to take every investor call, right? I, I, they want, I, I want to talk to them. I want to feel, I just feel like personally, like I needed to take all those calls, right? And sure. eventually it's like, well, if I really want to double my number of investor calls or, you know, investors that are coming in, well, I just can't do it. I mean, it's just not possible, right? And so when I finally thought about it like that, it was like, okay, well, I should be training someone else right now, right? And to start doing that. And so we did, right? And so it started, you know, handing that off gradually. And so now, hey, we can take a lot more calls, you know, and, and expand that bandwidth and be prepared for that. Uh, but there was a mindset shift that had to happen where I, I don't have to be the one to do that thing or whatever it may be. Uh, but tell me this though, how do you look at Devin, you know, when you're thinking about this thing, you're, this process or this thing you're fixing to bring into the company, hey, we're going to start doing whatever it may be, but it may not be something that you personally want to jump into and learn how to do. Like it may be something more technical. It may be something just completely out of your wheelhouse. You see that we need that. And maybe I hire a professional to, Hey, just come and do it for us or to teach us how to do or teach someone. Like you mentioned, Hey, you jump in, you build the process, hand it off to somebody. But what about if it's something that uh, it may not be the best use of your time to like really go study it for two months and, you know, or six months and learn how to do this thing that you know you need? Yeah, great question, Whitney. I, I struggle with that a lot because I've one of the things that helped me early on was I can do a lot of stuff pretty good. I can I can write copy, I can do design, I can do web pages, I can, you know, I can sell, I'm technical, I can build Excel models, like pretty good. I'm not saying I'm the master, but I can do all that stuff from you know previous experience in the corporate world and things like that. And, and, and I'm a I'm a lifelong learner, always studying and learning stuff. So that was great to get things up and running um, inexpensively and quick. But now as the leader of a larger organization, it's like, is the CEO really going to do that? Like that's a very poor allocation of resources. Um, so I struggle with it. A, a real eye opener for me was starting the property management company, which is a great example of what you said, where, look, I know, what needs to happen on site to run a you know 200 unit property i don't want to do any of it right i mean i it's just not not my skill set not anything i want to do and and i just took the same approach with the property management company i said you know what i am not going to if i'm going to start a management company which i actually didn't never wanted to but then i was uh had a really bad experience with a third party company on a couple of deals and i had i figured it was the best way forward but the key was it was the right who, right? I've found the right person and said, listen, you start and run this company and he spelled it all out. So it was a win-win situation for everybody. And to see that company now, granted, I took some risk. I wrote the check to start the company, you know, all that stuff, but I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I do. Um, but to see that company just explode with very minimal oversight from me, basically just direction and some capital. Uh, and to see it explode and, and to, you know, show up at events where there's dozens of employees and I didn't interview a single one of them and to see the numbers and see that things are going really well without my involvement. That, that was like a, a real light bulb moment for me, which, you know, as an entrepreneur happens like, uh, you know, on a weekly basis with, with growth, but um, huge light bulb moment for me to say, you know, this is somebody that I really hired specifically for their high level expertise compensated very well and turn them loose and holy smokes. You know, I, the, after that, in fact, I was driving with my son the other day, I have three children. Um, uh, and, and the oldest, my oldest boy who's 12 was, we're riding somewhere. I don't remember. He said, dad, how do you, uh, how do you hire people? That, that, that sounds hard. I said, yeah, it is hard. I said, but I actually hired a guy to hire people. And he said, you can hire somebody to hire people. I said, yeah, you can. And he said, 
Oh, that's what I'm going to do. That sounds way better. And I said, it is better. If you can, if you could be in that position to find the right person. So that was a real eye opener. And that was a whole property management company, which is just, uh, you know, exploded, taken over all our properties, taken on some third-party clients. And, and really that was, you know, a huge opportunity for that person too. And it's a win-win scenario all the, all the way around. So that's given me um, a lot of confidence to look at some other things. And as we grow, there are some other uh, roles coming on board that are higher level um, that, that we're exploring. And you know, by no means is this, is this perfected. We're constantly fine tuning every day in our business, just like you guys and every other entrepreneur out there, but um, finding the right person and that you can create the vision for, and then kind of clear the lane and give them the resources to go execute. Uh, that, that's been, that's been huge, huge for me. And I'm excited about the future because it's like, what, you know, what else can we do now where we create an opportunity for somebody and clear the lane, remove obstacles, cap, you know, capitalize it and, and let them, let them go, you know, show up to work every day and build it. That's super exciting. Love that. Uh, finding the who. I mean, you hit the nail on the head right there. Uh, it's a, yeah, because that could have that could have just taken over your calendar, your time, your mental space, right? I mean, trying to do all of that yourself. I couldn't uh, have and, done and, it. I, I simply right. w- would have failed, right, if I tried to do it myself. So I want to go back to the processes and and talk about that because I think it's so important. Uh, it, but, but on that who for just one minute, give sure. us just one minute on finding that who, how you found that who that was so important there. Well, I wish I had a, a surefire method. I think part of it is kind of a God thing and there's just kind of some serendipity there, but it was also came out of some pain, right? I was trying to hire. I was tr- <laughs> I've told the story a few times, March, 2020, I had a deal under contract. It's a 20 something million dollar deal. I had some earnest money hard, um, you know, a hundred K hard of 250 K uh, but we're, Hey, we're, we're going along rock and rolling. This is a deeply distressed deal. It's like 50% occupied, but I've done stuff like that before I was ready to get in there and I'm trying to hire this third-party management company to take it over. So we've done our due diligence. The reason I was hiring this third-party management company was for this person and their team specifically. Um, then mid-March rolls around all the debt markets seize up. There's no debt for a you know, a 50% occupied 20 something million dollar property. And I terminated only time I've literally ever done that in my whole career, hundred K gone. I didn't fight it. Some people sue over that and go bananas. I said, no, look, I I signed the contract hundred K is hard, released it to the seller, told the property management company and specifically this person, boy, this is, you know, we're all kind of waiting for the next crash or whatever. It's been a long time since 2008. This might be it. We don't know what's happening, but we got to get out of this deal that there's no way anybody's going to lend on it. So terminated the deal, terminated the, you know, the, the relationship with that, that property management company, obviously, if we weren't going to close. Um, but a couple of weeks later, maybe weeks or months later, I got a text from that person that said, Hey, I left that company. And, you know, it was a real classic situation of get the right people on the bus, Jim Collins, good to great. Just get the right people on the bus first, then find a seat for them. And this was like, I got to, I, I have to be in business with this guy. So I thought maybe I got to hire him as an asset manager because we were using third-party management. And it was just kind of real clear to me one, one Sunday, it was like, let's, let's start a management company. And so I kind of came up with a comp plan and pitched it to him over text. And next thing you know, <laughs> you know we're, we're in business together. Huge leap of faith for me and him. Um, you know, fast forward, he's been promoted a few times. Uh, you know, we got all these employees taking over all our assets, third party, et cetera. But um, I guess to answer your question, it was really just, you know, if, you, if you're out there meeting people all the time, I think we all need to understand the, the ripples and the impacts of all of our interactions, whether it's the waiter that's giving you tea at lunch, whether it's your spouse somebody you see, uh, you know, out your, your kids, friends, parents, you know, whatever it is, those ripples are always out there. Right. And, and I think in all of our, in all of our interactions and, and things, you know, it's a small world in multifamily as, as you know, and uh, everybody kind of knows everybody and that stuff comes around. So I think just by being out there and trying to, trying to be a solid business person with a long-term perspective, which is, 
it seems like a lot of multifamily guys that I know are right. Real long-term perspective, not necessarily fighting over this nickel today, but what, what could this be in five, 10 years? Um, and, and I think just being that kind of a business person and understanding you're playing the, the long game here um, and trying to attract quality people is, and, and being a quality uh, business person yourself, I think is just going to attract those kind of people to you over time. No, that's awesome. I appreciate you elaborating uh, on that in a big way and, and just finding that who, and, and even you talking about uh, the ripples, you know, even the waiter, you know, thinking about that, I try to remind myself almost daily. It's like, you never know who you're speaking to, right? You never know right. this, who this person is, no matter how they're dressed, what they look like. You just, you can't judge a book by its cover, uh, no. and, and, you know? And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's great advice right there. And so I want to, I want to jump back to the processes that I want us to talk about that just a few more minutes to, uh, you know, sure. learning what you've learned now about document, the importance, right. Of documenting those processes, documenting them well, because you need that other person to be able to take that, those instructions run with it. Right. Uh, what are ways that, you know, you're doing that now that maybe you wish you had known years ago, uh, just elaborate on that process, maybe any tools that you use, uh, any way that's helped you to streamline that process. So it's done well. I'm, I'm so glad you asked. I love this stuff. I mean, I really am passionate about this type of stuff and I don't know whether it's because it's, it's technical, which I am sort of technically inclined, or if it's because of the, it, I'm an efficiency nut and the efficiency you can drive with it, with these kind of processes, like so eye opening as a business owner, but I'll just get real specific. One of my favorite things to do is we have a CRM we use in Sightly, and I, I don't know that it's better or worse than any of the other thousand CRMs out there, but we've got a process in there where we can track um, stages of things. Maybe it's a project or maybe it's an acquisition or any, you know, maybe it's, it's our, we have our podcast in there, for example. And when, <clears throat> when projects get to stages, it will fire off tasks to people. And I just couldn't be happier with that because, you know, I'll give you an example. We're going to buy this apartment community. Or we're going to buy this piece of land. It goes in this stage and it fires off 10 tasks to our office manager, best relations person, you know, get the attorney involved, open the bank account, do the, you know, like I said, those 52 tasks on this one project that we just created. Well, that automatically gets assigned. Um, my goal is that none get assigned to me. Now there might be a few, I, you know, approving the wire. Okay. I'm going to approve the wire, but everything else I want going to the team. And then it, as it moves through the stages, tasks are automatically fired off. So you have this big, and then within each task, you've got a link to a Google doc explaining the process or a short video. You know, we use, I use something called loom to capture these short little videos right on desktop and get a link for it. So if somebody else needed to step into that role and assume that task, well, here's the task, here's the due date, and here's a, here's a five minute training. So we don't necessarily have a um, operations manual that, you know, that's, that's four inches thick that you throw on somebody's desk. It's built per task and assigned based on where the, where the project is. Now that doesn't catch 100% of the work, but allows us to have a lot of projects going, a lot of different things happening, a lot of complexity that's all outside everybody's brain, right? It's in the system and the tasks are assigned with due dates in, in kind of manageable chunks because there might be 50 tasks on a whole project, but they're doled out in increments as the project goes through its stage. And it, it just everybody can just look at their task list for the day and work to that. And there's no, you know, Hey, did you do this follow up on this? You hadn't done this in two months. Do you remember how to do that? It's all baked in the system. It's out of our heads. And, and so that's that kind of task process and task automation based on stages has been um, really, really helpful, really, really helpful. And, and a huge weight off my mind to know that I can just kind of look at my tasks for the week. And if I'm executing those, then we're, we're on track. Love that. Uh, it's really just having a process of some kind, right? To document it. But you mentioned Insightly that I've heard that often, you know, that CRM, we use HubSpot. We also use something called Asana. Most people have heard of, you know, those task sure. management softwares. They do a lot of those same things. We Our team builds a process. And as soon as something is check, checked off, it'll send tasks to other people or email people, or, you know, you can tell to do so many different things. Oh, and yeah. what, I, what I love about that is it just it making sure that I'm always encouraging the team, hey, if it broke, 
like, let's fix it now. Right. So next time it doesn't happen. Right. And so it yes. just, it's just that continual improvement. Cause as you know, doing a deal, like something new comes up, right. Hey, Oh, well, we better start checking this from now on, you know, uh, but, uh, but just documenting, you mentioned like links to Google docs using loom, uh, through loom, recording your screen. You can even be talking, record, you know, it's yeah. Great. 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 Do you have anyone on the team that like manages the processes, uh, like making sure you have processes for everything? I think that's coming for us. So I, we have, it's interesting because on the property management side, I actually didn't build any of those processes, which was very difficult for me to, to let go of that. But the proof's in the pudding, right? I mean, if the NOI is there and the revenue is there and the occupancy and kind of the, the key performance indicators that we look at are all performing, then, then that's great. So, you know, the things I've built are really more on the private equity side of the house. Our investor relations manager has really taken over marketing in, in the investor relations and the portal and kind of owns those processes now. Uh, and then we're in the process of bringing some more people on over the next, call it six months to own more of that and effectively, you know, free me up. Yes, I've kind of built all this and I've put it in place, but you're right. It needs constant tending, right? It's a lawn. It, you don't just plant it and forget about it. Somebody got to come up that thing every week or it's going to get out of control. So some, you know, th there will be a, a, a groundskeeper, so to speak, <laughs> coming on in, at some point here, to just because these processes are fantastic, but it's probably like 80% of it, which is amazing. But it's not, a, it's not a hundred percent, you know, you're not going to build a robot that just grows the business as much as, uh, you know, we, we'd all want to, right. It's going to, there's going to be stuff that falls through the cracks, errors. Um, you know, you're using all these different software companies they, they have downtime. I mean, you name it, right. Just kind of gremlins in the system right now. I'm the person fixing a lot of that in a lot of cases. Um, and you know, future state for us is that I'm not the person, uh, overseeing that and fixing that. So it's a state of transition, like, like the business constantly is in. Of course. And now like you, I love your, the, just how you called it. What uh, would you say? Like not mowing the lawns, but something, you know, just grounds management, you know, that type of thing. Cause it is, it's ever changing. Right. But if you don't have it documented, man, you're, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Well, moving to just a, a few final questions, Devin, uh, you know, now just as the operator that you are, the business that you've grown and looking at just our, our landscape, you know, moving forward in this industry and business market, uh, you know, how are you preparing for a, you say potential downturn? Great question. We can't see around the corner, right? We None of us saw COVID coming in early 2020. Um, we don't know what's next, right? We've got a, a, we've got a lot of uh, inflation or price appreciation on all sort of goods and services across the board. So I think our, our thesis is really unchanged and that we're providing a fundamental need in housing there's a, and there's a shortage. And there's a lot of people moving to where we're buying assets in central Texas. So the thesis is unchanged. Um, we've got headwinds, right? Labor is expensive and hard to find. And it's a talent war and, and all that stuff. Um, I think we're always going to have headwinds and tailwinds. Right now, we got low interest rates, great loan terms, um, you know, some other, some other headwinds there. A lot of investor appetite to be in these deals. Okay, that's great. Tailwinds are, you know, the, the, the price of getting into new assets is, is climbing, the price of labor, finding people, all those things are, are headwinds. Uh, cap rate compression is good or bad, depending on where you sit in the transaction. Um, so the, 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 you know, our thesis in buying large multifamily, we're going to keep doing that, right? Um, I think in terms of preparation, it's creating systems and processes so that you know, your company's not reliant on any one person to continue executing, myself included, right? Um, and then cash reserves is a, is a basic, but, you know, monitoring those loan maturities, making sure those are far out. And this is just kind of basics, but something that, that we pay attention to because, you know, frankly, I see a lot of, a lot of operators out there with like loan maturities coming up and, and I'm going, man, that was a three-year maturity. How'd that sneak up on you? Right. Five-year maturity, whatever the case is, uh, monitoring that stuff, cash reserves. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the best investments is just getting the right people on the bus and investing in their training and their career. And a friend of mine runs a software company in Dallas. He says, uh, culture beats strategy every time. So that's hard for that's hard one for my analytical mind to to wrap around, but culture and being um, 
having the right people, having an, an environment for them to grow their careers since they, they're choosing to spend their time with us. And then being nimble, you know, I mean, I started out as a very nimble entrepreneur, scrappy entrepreneur, still am. It's, which is a little harder to do once you build all these systems and this, this big team, but I'm still very opportunistic on looking for new ways to deploy capital, to get investors returns. Um, you know, we started a land investing business, which has really taken off. And that's just, that's another avenue. And I'm open to future avenues. Maybe in the future, we look at self-storage, we look at new construction. I'm not saying we're going to do those things, but you know, if, if our ability to buy B and C multifamily stop tomorrow, I'm confident we could pivot to something else and continue, continue running. Now, I don't, I don't want that to happen because we, we, we love this business, but I think just being open and out small level, prove the model out and then investor capital in the future is, um, as a possibility. So those are kind of things we're, we're doing to, to stay uh, in a good spot um, into the future because none of us know what that holds. So, uh, some great points there. I mean, it sounds like like proper financing, uh, having cash reserves, uh, being nimble, flexible. I mean, those things. And you might know you mentioned a few others, but uh, man, it's, it's just preparing you, right, for the unknown, right? Like you said, nobody knows what's going to happen over the next six months, but man, there's ways that you can definitely be better prepared. Uh, we've seen so many people survive things like that because of these ways that you, that you mentioned. Uh, quickly, what's your best source for meeting new investors right now or your team? You mentioned like you built that process. Now you just see that happening. What's a, a couple of things that have helped that to grow fast? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a hard one, but it's a track record of years and a bunch of full cycle deals that exceeded uh, pro forma. <laughs> you know, once, once you could get that little thing out of the way, um, <laughs> that little thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. people basically just tell their friends, you know, yeah. Hey, there's this dentist that's been investing with us for five years. Well, who's he friends with a bunch of other dentists that don't know, you know, where to place their capital. So yep. referrals by far. And Justin's our investor relations manager. He does a great job, you know, onboarding new folks, making them feel welcome. And, you know, that's his, that's his full-time job, right? So he, he can do a lot more of that than I ever could um, doing that. Cause I look, I want to be on all those calls too, right? I enjoy that stuff. If there was 150 hours in the day, I would do it. And there's, there's just not. So um, referrals for sure. I mean, like I said, that flywheel effect, you've got to work really hard to build it. But once you go on full cycle on a couple of those projects, um, you, you know, it's just, you and I know, and it, you, you guys listening know that the, the, the right deal structured the right way is it, this, this checks all the boxes for, for an investment. It, it's, it's the best, right? I and mean, that's why we're all doing it. So once the, the word gets out and you've got a track record there, um, it becomes kind of, I, I call it a kind of a snowball rolling downhill. Like, I don't know, if, I don't know if we could stop it. The challenge now is finding deal flow for that. It's that flywheel effect, just like you mentioned at the beginning, right? It takes yeah. a while, it takes lots of hustle to get that thing going, like pushing a train almost, right? Uh, well, Devin, uh, how do you like to give back? We started, uh, my wife and I started the DJE Foundation in, in January 2020. And I started it to, uh, it's something I'd always wanted to do. We started to help a friend of mine fund an, orphan, an orphanage in the Philippines. And then it's just grown. So a lot of our companies, various companies' profits go to the foundation. This is not out of investor profits, right? Investors get what they get, but for our company profits, go to the foundation. And we supported um, mostly children's causes in South Texas and the orphanage in the Philippines. And I am just getting started on philanthropy. I know it's a whole world. I know you know a lot about that. Um, I feel like I've got decades and decades to get good at it, but it's been pretty cool um, to, to, to have started that and to, to be able to give like meaningful amounts of money to you know, causes and, and things I believe in. So just getting started on that, really excited about what the future holds there. 
Awesome. Well, Devin, it's been a pleasure, honor to have you back on the show and even to get to know you a little better, let the listeners know you a little better, and hopefully encourage, I mean, to hear your story from 60 units to 400 unit projects, uh, you know, 3000 plus in total, I mean, 40 plus uh, employees, just what you have grown and thinking about, you know, you being the visionary, being able to pull back by building these processes, finding the who's who. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, which is another great book around that, by the way, uh, and uh, by uh, uh, Dan Sullivan. Uh, and so, uh, but just thanks again for just being willing to share, uh, you know, about your processes and how you've done that. So, hey, we can do the same thing and kind of get out of our own way a little bit, right? Uh, but, you know, Devin, how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about DJE? Sure. So the website's the catch-all, djetexas.com, Delta Juliet Echo, Texas spelled out.com. You can contact us. we got podcasts. we got, you know, projects up there, all kind of stuff. That'd be the spot to go. And um, I just want to say thank you for, for having me on. I love what you guys are doing with your business, your growth, your hustle with the podcast um, and and the philanthropy, which is a huge part of what you guys do. So I just feel uh, honored to always get to connect with you. And I, and I love watching your journey. So thank, thank you for connecting again. It's always good to catch up. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.